So I take great pleasure to invite uh, my good friend, Ambassador Dominic Jeremy, to tell about the British story. Yeah. Thank you, Padina. Terima kasih. Selamat siang, selamat kalian. Masih tidur? Selamat siang. Terima kasih. Shakespeare's take on climate change. And through this distemperature, we see the seasons alter. The spring, the summer, the autumn, angry winter change and make the mazed world not know which is which. A different take. Separdi Joko Domono. Ta ada yang libi arif dari hujan bulan juni. Di berkanya yang tak terucapkan di serap akar pohon bunga itu. So why do I mention that one? Well, that beautiful poem, Hujan Bulan um, uh, Juni, is all about somebody whose love is so special, it's so unusual, that it is like having rain in Jakarta in June during the dry season. Okay. So that's one take on climate change. Why do I mention Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream? Well, he was talking about climate change caused by a fight between the king and the queen of the fairies. Well, frankly, ladies and gentlemen, I just wish climate change today had such a simple and innocent cause. In the United Kingdom, we've been thinking about climate change and nature for hundreds of years. In about 60 years after William Shakespeare in the 70th, 17th century, a man called John Evelyn. Now, this guy, he's a scientist. He was one of the founders of our Royal Academy, our Special Science Academy. Um, and he wrote a treatise, he like, wrote a, a textbook on air pollution caused by burning coal in London. Air pollution caused by burning coal, sound familiar to anybody? And that was 350 years ago. And what he did was, he didn't only set out what the problem was, but he dedicated his book to King Charles II, the ruler, because he recognized that if you want to tackle climate pollution, you need to have political power behind you. And he also came up with some of the solutions. And they include, and I quote, by reason of the frequent plantations of trees and nurseries for ornament, profit and security, unquote. Today, we'd call that a nature-based solution to climate change. So fast forward from the 17th century to the 21st century, from King Charles II to King Charles III last year at COP28 in Dubai, and his message to global leaders was, the hope of the world rests on the decisions you must take. Now, a lot has happened in the 360 years since those two King Charleses. Amongst other things, in the UK, we've experienced an industrial revolution that was originally driven by fossil fuels. And that gave us great wealth and power, but it also had a massively negative impact on our environment, on our nature, and frankly, on our traditional ways of life. And that peaked, that came to its worst point in 1952, and there was something called the Great Smog. And this was air pollution in London that was so bad, 8,000 people died in one week. I mean, just imagine that. Next time you're getting fed up with air pollution in Jakarta. 8,000 people died in London in one week in 1952 because of air pollution. And so that kicked off for the UK our long, and slow and painful transition away from fossil-based fuels. How did we do that? Well, I remember as a kid, um, in growing up in the UK in the 1970s and 1980s, I remember that there were strikes by coal miners, a bitter dispute in 1984. Um, there were protests in the streets because people felt that the government had forgotten the just part about just energy transition 
a critical element. And also there were even power cuts. So this was really hard, but we got through that and we came to um, a decision that as a country we were going to change our politics. Now one of our first prime ministers um, to think about climate change, one of the first global leaders to think about climate change was actually Margaret Thatcher, who was, uh, for all her many faults, um, the person I remember um, uh, associated with those miners', minors strikes in 1984. In the prime ministership of Gordon Brown, he introduced the legally binding Climate Change Act that Pagdino has just mentioned. Prime Minister um, Theresa May introduced a legally binding commitment to net zero by 2050. And then Prime Minister Boris Johnson, he hosted COP26. Now, this was the first global summit on climate change since the Rio Earth Summits that really brought nature back into climate negotiations, absolutely critical to solve the whole climate problem. Um, and then the new government of Sir Keir Starmer, our prime minister who came in last month, that has committed to the UK, uh, the UK to zero carbon electricity by 2030. So we're making decarbonizing our economy an absolute driver for how we think politically. And we've been at the forefront of climate and nature science as the UK since the, 20, since the 19th century. You remember Charles Darwin? Charles Darwin? Good. He was one of the first thinkers about nature. He transformed our ideas about nature. And he did that by observing Galapagos finches. Um, but while he was doing that, at the same time here in Indonesia, Alfred Russell Wallace was looking at endemic Indonesian species across your archipelago. And so the science that we have today has moved on since then, but we stand, ladies and gentlemen, on the shoulders of giants. But it's not just scientists you need. You've got to get the politics right, you've got to get the science right, but you also need economists involved in decarbonizing your economy. And there are two outstanding British economists I want to mention. One is Lord Stern, and the other is Pater Dasgupta. And they produced two, um, two reports uh, on the economics of biodiversity and the economics of climate change. And these two reports brought business into the whole climate and nature conversation almost for the first time. And that enables us to bring private capital and private sector solutions into tackling climate change. They also put a value on the natural world, and that is essential, because now we can actually understand the cost of nature and climate that we've been exploiting as though they are a free good. So with a science right, with a politics right, the policies should follow. And the policies need to be based on evidence, data, and science. In the UK, our science-based policies mean our emissions have nearly halved, in fact, they are already half of our baseline in 1990, and they are on the way down. So get this, last year in 2023, our emissions were lower than they were at the very height of the pandemic in 2020, when our economy had been shut down for six months of the year. And indeed, we've kept on course despite the massive impact to European fuel supply caused by Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine. And in fact, as a result of that, Europe has managed to end its addiction to fossil fuels from Russia. So how are we doing this in the UK? Number one, by leaving coal behind and embracing renewable energy. In practice, for us, decarbonization means hundreds of thousands of green jobs, as Pat Dino mentioned earlier. It means a much better air quality in the UK. And part of that is this year, we are closing our final coal-fired power station. No more coal-fired power stations in the United Kingdom after this year. Um, and it also means economic growth, which is critical for governments to deliver to their people. And in the UK, our economy has grown by 80% since our 1990 baseline. So number two, we're doing this because we have a system for action that doesn't allow politicians to meddle with it. And that is critical. So we have a 
um, a committee, an independent committee of scientists and experts. It's called the Climate Change Committee, um, and they set carbon budgets for um, the whole economy. And that committee and their advice and this way of approaching carbon budgets has survived five general elections in the UK, and it survived seven prime ministers. And number three, number three, we are embracing nature. And nature provides some of the cheapest and the best ways of tackling climate change, as John Evelyn understood way back in the 17th century. In Indonesia, you do this with, with mangrove replanting. You, you preserve your forest, you replant forests. You have some sustainable approaches to agriculture, like, um, like Bali's subak system. Well, in the UK, um, we've committed to um, a 30 by 30 rule protecting 30% of our land and 30% of our ocean by 2030 and restoring those natural ecosystems. So you get the policies right, the politics right, the science right, and then you've got to get people to care. And so finally, I'd like to close by mentioning an outstanding nature and climate change communicator, um, Jane Goodall and David Attenborough. Have you heard of either of those? Excellent. Well, when I was a kid, they were the people who made me care about nature, about biodiversity, about climate change. And now people in the UK, they vote for climate action because of some outstanding communicators who've really made us care. So before I finish, um, you might wonder what the map is with all these pins on. These are projects, programs, that the UK and Indonesia are doing that are about biodiversity restoration, they're about tackling climate change, they're about sustainable infrastructure, and they are about renewable energy. And those are ones that we're doing together in your country. So if there is one message I would like all of you to take from my talk today, it is that people in the UK really care about restoring biodiversity and about taking action on climate change and that we want to do that in partnership with you. So please take action, whatever you do. I would love it if you came to my country, to the UK, um, to study uh, in this space. There are achieving scholarships from the UK government, LPDP scholarships as well, many of them to the United Kingdom. I would love you to get in touch with me and my embassy to see what we're doing because the basic message is, none of us can tackle climate change alone. Tetapi bersama kita bisa. So if Dina will allow me, I'm just going to close and you've got to say chuck up for my pontoon, okay? Pergi kemal beli sepatu. Beli dua gratis satu. Net zero, FPCI. Di hari Sabtu, <laughs> emang boleh sekarang itu. <laughs> Terima kasih.